my name is Karthik. Uh, I work with XKDI Forum. And uh, my co-author on this uh, paper is Varsha Ithala, who is a visiting faculty at uh, National Law School of India University. Uh, we are writing about uh, broadly India's challenging and accessing legal services. Uh, what, I mean, what we mean by this is that it's difficult for people in India to find lawyers for their personal or for their uh, legal problems. And we want to give you a descriptive narration of why that is the case, right? Uh, we're going to talk about what factors that affect the provision of these legal services in India and why this is an information or a quality signaling problem. What are what, what quality signaling aspects like here? Uh, and we're talking about some solutions that have come from the private sector. And we'll talk generally, we'll have a broad-ended discussion uh, and Q&A after that. And of course, Pratik uh, will be sharing his, uh, his, his feedback and his discussion on our paper as well. So uh, a version of this paper we presented earlier at uh, 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 another seminar series and before that at the NLS uh, seminar series. Uh, we've made some changes to the, uh, to the narrative. We've spoken more about uh, legal education. We've spoken about uh, the, uh, the quality of a lawyer or the quality of training given to a lawyer at the level of entry into the profession. We've made some uh, additions on that front. We've also spoken about uh, uh, other factors like uh, uh, registration and the bar exam itself, which uh, which have which have changed from the paper since. So we uh, look forward to your feedback on this. So the argument we are making is really uh, a a single straight uh, linear uh, an argument where we talk about how there is a problem of unmet legal needs and the problem we are talking about in this presentation is that of access to lawyers. Now, there are two ways that this problem could be mitigated. One is you either make it easier for people to find lawyers, and two is really about the quality or the standards of the bar, right? We are also, I mean, there's also the third element of, you know, improving quantity, having more lawyers in the country. We do touch upon that, but that's not the, that's not a main uh, limb, but that's not a main part of the argument uh, as I'll, I'll soon discuss. Now, in India, broadly what we found, uh, what we, uh, see is that both of these attempts, uh, both finding lawyers as well as, you know, improving for quality, they've either not materialized or they haven't taken off. Uh, and our explanations are threefold. Uh, firstly, there are, there are issues with professional quality control. Uh, there is a lack of a level playing field in the profession due to historic and present reasons. And thirdly, and uh, more specifically and narrowly, there are certain regulations that restrict how a lawyer can seek engagements. Uh, so one argument with three uh, uh, reasons as to why we think that is. So uh, now we let's talk about the factors that uh, <clears throat> the factors that affect the provision of legal services in India. Now here we are talking about uh, specifically factors that, uh, uh, like we said, quality and uh, accessibility. So we'll first give you a, uh, we'll, we'll first give an overview of the Indian legal profession, how it developed historically, how the Indian legal profession is regulated, uh, what are the constraints that are there, uh, what are these responses that the regulators and others have uh, come up with, and how they have, well, worked or not worked. And then we'll come to how there are uh, really market factors that have affected the provision of legal services in India. So. Uh, just a brief overview of the Indian legal profession. Historically, there were really two parallel sets of professions, right? Uh, on the one hand, you had the Indian side, so to speak. You had people who were called vakils and muhtars. Uh, vakils were people who were uh, people who had a, law, a graduation or a, or, a, or a degree or a formal education, and muhtars were people who did not. Uh, they typically practiced law at what were called mofusil courts, and they spoke the local language and they generally had Indians as clients. Uh, this is what you think of as the, uh, I mean, the literature likes to call these, uh, these class of lawyers as Indian lawyers, uh, as opposed to, well, English lawyers during, uh, you know, the British uh, colonial period, where you had barristers and solicitors, most of whom, but not all, were trained in England. Uh, and they typically practiced law in the presidency cities and they uh, practiced at the high courts. 
they spoke in english they conducted their practice in english and their clients were tended to be sophisticated firms europeans and wealthy indians mostly uh, this of course is not uh, static this changed as india came closer to independence and completely changed after independence uh, the first broad attempt at regulating advocates regulating lawyers uh, came in 1926 uh, when uh, the high courts made rules to govern lawyers within their jurisdiction before sorry before 1926 the high courts made rules to govern lawyers within their jurisdiction in 1926 uh, there was the indian bar councils act which was really the first formal regulatory body before which you had the high courts uh, and of course uh, the advocates act uh, brought parity formal parity uh, between the indian side and the english side by recognizing only advocates and senior advocates right now coming to bar councils uh, in 1926 there were state or rather proven provincial level bar councils which were primarily tasked with the admission of advocates and they determined cases of professional misconduct after independence uh, in 1961 the advocates act uh, created the bar council of india at the union level and the distinction between the state bar councils and the union uh, the bar council of india is that the bci is tasked with the laying down of rules and standards of professional conduct designing the framework for edu legal education regulating the compliance of universities with these uh, legal education frameworks and making rules for lawyers who seek to practice law in india with foreign qualifications right now this distinction between the bci and state bar councils is by design uh, i think the uh, task bar is hiding a footnote there which says that the uh, concurrent list entry 26 uh, makes a distinct uh, the concurrent list uh, or rather legal the, the regulation of the legal profession is a matter for the concurrent list which means both the union and state can make uh, laws on this right so this distinction is really by design a uh, constitutional design we what ended up have i mean the outcome that we saw uh, over the years is that uh, this mechanism has a lot of problems uh, the supreme court itself noted in 2016 uh, in a pil that was raised against uh, the bci that the bci court appears to have no effective administrative and disciplinary control over state bar councils and local bar associations right so that brings us to our point of uh, state capacity for regulation of lawyers uh, there are some common problems between the bci and the state bar councils uh, the law commission noted that there are they are not transparent about uh, the rules that uh, that get enforced vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis lawyers there are quote defensive reactions to changes that affect the profession etc et some observations were made on that front uh, one example which i think would bring this problem to light is uh, at point 2 the first line which uh, well Uh, the bci does not have data on the number of advocates in india and this is uh, i mean the the bci uh, filed an affidavit in the supreme court when the supreme court asked them about this question uh, in 2015 the supreme court said uh, please then find out uh, the number of lawyers in india by doing a nationwide verification exercise of advocate registrations the bci said that there is a problem of fake lawyers uh, people who practice the law without proper qualifications and uh, uh, to improve the quality of the bar the supreme court ordered uh, a verification exercise uh, this exercise is not yet complete uh, now the most recent development on this front was that uh, well just two months ago the advocates act was amended uh, it was amended to grant powers to high courts district court session districts and session judges uh, district magistrates and revenue officers to Uh, publish a list of touts who purport to practice the law without the necessary qualifications those who are on this list are liable to imprisonment and fine uh, so yeah what i mean the verification exercise according to the bci was not complete because the state bar councils have not supplied the bci with uh, the information about how many lawyers have been enrolled with each uh, and like we saw the enrollment of lawyers is a state bar councils uh, subject whereas the uh, uh, framing of qualifications or framing of uh, what standards it takes to be granted an enrollment is that of the bci so there is that tension that has been uh, that we can see through the supreme court case uh, when it comes to misconduct uh, if a client is aggrieved by the misconduct of an advocate 
uh, like we saw, they can file a complaint with the State Bar Council. Uh, the State Bar Council is required to dispose of the complaint within one year, failing which the case is transferred to be heard by the BCI. Uh, the Supreme Court in uh, 2021 noted that there is a practice among the state bar councils to quote deliberately delay the hearing of the complaint so that it automatically needs to be transferred to the BCI. Uh, the same Supreme Court order notes that uh, the BCI has a total of 1,273 complaints which were pending with it. Uh, 650 odd of those complaints were filed in the previous two years. Uh, and we do not have a, a time series uh, of uh, how long these complaints have been pending and how many complaints the BCI receives each year. Now, we also note that uh, according to uh, the, the rules on misconduct, uh, a panel of advocates decides on whether an advocate has breached the rules of professional conduct. Uh, this is called system of peer justice. This has also led to allegations of regulatory capture. Uh, Given that uh, we spoke about how the BCI does not know that, uh, uh, or rather, there is no clear or accurate sense of how many lawyers, uh, how many advocates are uh, in India, uh, one estimate that the chairperson of the BCI uh, uh, shared in 2013 uh, was that of 1.7 million registered advocates, right? Uh, even if we take this 1.7 million registered advocates uh, as our, as our uh, final figure, we arrive at a lawyer to citizen ratio in India or a lawyer to well, Indian ratio of 1 is to 752, right? Now, Mark Gallanter in 1989 carried out a similar exercise where his estimate was one lawyer for every 356 Indians. So this means that on a per capita basis, the number of lawyers available, the pool of lawyers available has halved. Now, this is a quantity problem as well as we can see. And just for context, in, in England and Wales, they, uh, there is, they have one solicitor for every 285 people. Also, in England and Wales, the, uh, there are two classes of lawyers. You have barristers and solicitors. So we only found information on solicitors. Uh, now, this is, uh, well, at least a first view of, uh, first evidence of a quantity problem, but we do not touch upon that. Yes. And I'll talk about that. Yes. How does it change your view? So if somebody in 2013 says 1.7 million, and then you are given that 2015 fact. How do you update? What's your posterior move? Uh, I we can't say for sure because the BCI says that the exercise is incomplete and a lot of states have not submitted their final uh, uh, numbers. So I, I really don't know. Sorry, but uh, just if you go ahead. Okay, so I'll also very quickly touch upon how legal education is conducted in India. And I think uh, uh, a lot of this is something we already uh, might know. Uh, legal education before 1987 was available only to those who had completed at least three years of university education. Uh, now, this was, of course, before NLS IU was set up. At NLS, the changes they made in 1987 were that they admitted high school graduates through a national competitive test for the first time. And this was a five-year law, law program, which was at the time fully residential. The intent was to create a new and better trained class of professionals. Uh, in 2012, uh, the prime minister in a speech at a convocation of one of these universities said that national law universities are, quote, islands of excellence, while uh, generally referring to other colleges uh, as, quote, sea of mediocrity, which was very controversial. But I think the... Uh, uh, last point is uh, is uh, very is very relevant because the disparity in fees is pretty significant. Uh, the annual fees at NLS is close to three more than three and a half lakh, uh, which includes tuition, boarding, and meals. Uh, the annual fees at the Faculty of Law at Delhi University, which is uh, an, a representative example of a three-year course, was only was less than rupees five thousand. Okay. Now let's also talk about the bar exam because uh, uh, that was the Bar Council and the uh, Ministry of, I mean, the, the legal community's response to the quality problem in the late 2000s, early 2010s. Uh, now, the way the system currently works is that upon graduating from a law school, one has to provisionally enroll with the State Bar Council as an advocate. Now, we also note that this cost of enrollment varies across states. Like we said, enrollment is a state subject. So, uh, in neighboring states of West Bengal and Odisha, you can see the fee disparity. 
uh, enrollment is finalized when the advocate has passed the All India Bar Examination. Uh, one has to pass the All AIBE within two years of enrollment. However, uh, many reports uh, have suggested or have made the case that the AIBE has not succeeded in acting as an effective control for quality. Uh, we also note that uh, unlike uh, other professions in India, the requirements of uh, uh, apprenticeship or the requirements of a residency program uh, are they are in the form of a, 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 a legal aid or an ethics clinic at, at minimum at a law school but well that's mostly about it. Uh, there's no compulsory articleship program uh, that lawyers uh, today have to uh, 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 address as per the statute as per the rules. Uh, the BCI, in fact, in 2019 noted that many advocates simply don't take the exam and they continue practicing. Uh, the BCI has also admitted to administrative issues, uh, such as incorrect results being supplied, incorrect or badly framed questions, etc. Uh, some of us in the room would have taken the All India Bar, bar Examination and I, I mean, I'm sure uh, might relate. So uh, we filed a, a, a right to information and we got the uh, uh, failure rates of uh, candidates at every round of the All India Bar Exam and we can see the uh, the variation. It's, well, very rough average of 20% of candidates uh, are not able to pass this exam. Uh, the exam, by the way, is, uh, as far as I know, it's open book uh, and uh, multiple choice. And I'm not sure if there is a negative mark. I'm, I should check this out. So this brings us to the, uh, to the, to the, way the uh, profession has developed uh, over the few centuries, over the last uh, couple of centuries. Uh, and now that we have the uh, story about the background of the Indian legal profession and how it is regulated and how its entry is governed, uh, let's talk about the concept of prestige in the Indian legal profession, right? So the term prestige is something that uh, uh, lawyers talk about very, very often. Uh, like, for example, when uh, lawyers uh, back in 2013 opposed the introduction of service tax upon, uh, upon lawyers, on advocates, uh, the, the arguments that were made were that the legal profession is a noble profession and cannot be considered a service. Uh, that's one of the many ways by which the narrative of prestige is so uh, entrenched in the legal profession. Uh, in the, and this has been there in both the, uh, what we saw, the Indian and the English side of the profession. Uh, in the Indian side, the Vakil Munshi relationship was instrumental in developing a flourishing practice and a large roster of clients. Uh, when it comes to the president, when it came to the presidency cities, uh, Gallanter, Mark Gallanter and Nick Robinson, they coined the term quote, grand advocates, right? Grand advocates are a stratum of legal superstars who are very visible, renowned and in high demand. They are fluent in English. They have family connections and they come from a specific social stratum and junior lawyers are easily referred to work with these leading lawyers from the same stratum, right? So uh, when we see this together, we see that the uh, one dominant way by which uh, how good or how effective a lawyer is historically has been how prestigious that lawyer is because uh, when you couple that with the Indian practice of relying on oral advocacy as opposed to written submissions or planning or estate work, uh, most Indian lawyers are, uh, are oral advocates and that influences what are what is called face time with the judge, right? And the consequence of this is that the Indian bar remains stratified uh, with uh, what uh, Gallinter and Robinson call the grabbing of work by a few members of the bar leaving many juniors underemployed. Now, uh, quite a few decades ago, uh, Morrison, uh, which I mean, this is a, uh, uh, classification which might still hold true. Morrison described four types of Indian lawyers. One is the what he called leading advocates, which are well uh, the grand advocates in, in the same vein as we discussed grand advocates earlier. Then he calls another, the next class, which is below top, extra, uh, lawyers with more than 10 years of practice. Average, uh, well, he says men uh, with many years of practice and they may hold a position in their community outside the bar but they lack the district-wide professional reputation of top practitioners uh, and the last, uh, which is the largest category of briefless lawyers, right? So uh, he talks about, uh, I mean, the context he's talking about was his field study at the district courts in Ambala in Haryana, 
he talks about how uh, uh, factors like caste and kinship play a major role in how uh, prestige is built over a lawyer's uh, lifespan of uh, or span of practice and uh, you know he notes things like how uh, lawyers coming from a certain caste uh, they would be engaged by people from their caste uh, but it would it may not have been easy for uh, people from other castes to hire that lawyer it gives you examples of uh, you know brahmin lawyers and rajput rajput lawyers in that sense which you can find in our paper which uh, we've shared uh, now given that there are these uh, uh, constraints that we've uh, discussed both in terms of formal regulation as well as uh, you know the st structure of the profession uh, Gallantine and Robinson noted these the following mitigation strategies. So what happens is Indian lawyers tend to practice independently uh, and they rarely collaborate. Only an estimated 2 to 3 percent of lawyers work with a firm. Uh, Indian lawyers are, like I said earlier, oriented towards oral arguments and not uh, drafting, advising and uh, negotiation work. And lawyers do not limit themselves to one area of the law. They are relatively unspecialized. This is to be able to uh, uh, find or uh, develop the broadest uh, clientele possible, right? Uh, the consequence is that clients in India typically tend to have an episodic engagement with their lawyer. They tend to approach their lawyer at a relatively later stage of the dispute. And as a result, even sophisticated clients who have little experience of lawyers and therefore they, sorry, sophisticated clients have little experience with lawyers and therefore have no baseline with which they can measure good conduct and quality. Now, we wanted to, uh, I mean, a lot of this literature is, uh, is uh, not, uh, not recent, so we wanted to assess our priors. Uh, so we spoke to, uh, I mean, this is a very unstructured way by which we just wanted to assess our priors and get a, a rough kind of a legal need survey going. There have been larger scale legal need survey that, uh, for example, Dutch carried out in 2015 and 17, but uh, what we did was we spoke to 37 individual clients and 25 litigating lawyers to learn from their experiences. Uh, the majority of clients, they found their lawyer through a family member or a friend. Uh, and uh, four of them found their, their lawyer by being after being referred to by another lawyer. And when it comes to fees, the large majority of lawyers, they collect lump sum amounts. So the uh, American stereotype, I guess, of uh, hourly payments is not really prevalent in India. Uh, among the lawyers we spoke to, there is a fairly even split among these lawyers who felt that advertising should be allowed or not, which is something we will cover in uh, the forthcoming slides. Uh, the lawyers reported that their clients were mostly referred to them by either by other lawyers or by existing clients, followed by friends and family. Uh, and lawyers seem to differ on when they perceive their engagement to begin. Now, what I mean by this, some lawyers say that uh, the first time their client contacts them is when the engagement begins. Some lawyers say that the engagement begins only when the Vakalat Nama is signed. Uh, there are differences of opinion on, on that point. So let's now talk about uh, what information uh, constraints do uh, does the Indian legal profession have uh, when it comes to signaling for quality. Now this works both ways. Uh, clients do not have a good assurance of the quality of their lawyer because of what we spoke about, regulatory and quality issues. And lawyers are also not able to signal to their quality effectively to their client. Uh, this is largely due to the inherently stratified nature of the profession and its reliance on prestige. So this uh, brings us to the uh, formal regulations on advertising. Historically in India, advertising has been considered as tantamount to solicitation. Uh, the Supreme Court in 1962 in a case said that uh, if a lawyer were to solicit briefs, he is an unworthy member of the of the learned profession, right? And this rule is formalized in Rule 36 of the BCI Standards of Professional Conduct and Etiquette, where lawyers shall not solicit, where advocates shall not solicit work or advertising any manner. Now, uh, the origins of this rule may lie in the deep association of the profession with prestige. Uh, however, this is changing and uh, while there were restrictions on advertising in uh, the developed countries as well, uh, in the 1970s through the 1990s, in most developed countries, rules on advertising were relaxed. Uh, in the in England, in the UK, lawyers can advertise in, I think, nearly all of the European Union they can. The US, uh, well, I mean, uh, 
is is known for its practice of lawyers advertising on billboards, etc. Right now, the trigger for the Supreme Court to hear a petition which challenges these rules was the COVID was the onset of the COVID nineteen pandemic lockdowns. Uh, typically, lawyers would uh, 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 you know clients would hire lawyers either by like I said informal networks or connections or by uh, physically meeting them in the premises of a court uh, that couldn't happen uh, after the onset of the pandemic. So the uh, community of law advocates in India has uh, started to change its opinion on uh, uh, the listing of uh, you know advocates portals being available for law matching of lawyers, etc. Right? Now, one of the comments we got earlier was about legal aid. Uh, in many uh, developed countries, legal aid has served as a solution for this problem, of, for the access problem. But in India, uh, Vasha has done some work on uh, how, and many other authors have done work on how legal aid hasn't hasn't worked out in India. Uh, legal aid is guaranteed by the Constitution, Article 39A. Uh, it's a directive principle, but sure. Uh, now, advocate fees are regulated in some states. Uh, usually by the high court, but these regulations are seldom enforced. Now, this may not be a, a problem in and of itself, but there are two consequences of, of, of this regulation. One is that uh, in the context of an information gap, the client in India has little access to actual fees. Secondly, uh, legal aid programs are tied to these uh, regulations. Now, the absence of these regulations may not present a problem, but uh, what uh, some work has shown, a lot of work has shown is that these fees rules are really not followed. Free legal aid rules are not followed because oftentimes the advocate then asks for a fee. The second uh, aspect is that the judicial system lacks the capacity to provide effective legal aid solutions. So one uh, such statistic that surprised me uh, was that public spending in legal aid has even reduced in cert certain states. I think the uh, total spending on legal aid in 2021 was uh, 105 crore, which is less than one rupee per capita. So, so there are some solutions that have emerged from the private sector, but uh, the uh, uh, position of these, uh, or rather the uh, regulatory situation of these uh, 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 operations are not very clear. There are two ways in which the private sector has initiatives. One is that firms carry out functions that lawyers typically do, but are not their exclusive preserve. Tax filings and conveyancing are two such examples, and there are two such firms. There are then portals which allow lawyers to list their personal information, basic details of their professional experience, and even a schedule of rates, which does a lot to improve the information gap. Uh, but uh, we compiled uh, 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 the the uh, locations of the lawyers who are uh, who list themselves on these portals and you can see that the red dots are mostly close to the big cities uh, Mumbai Delhi Bangalore Chandigarh Lucknow etc right this is also with the other portals that we saw you can see the same problem play out here so the reach of these portals is uh, is fairly limited so that brings us to uh, the the uh, 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 final points you'd like to make. So uh, what would help is firstly the BCI regulations that uh, place restrictions on advertising, they could be, they should be removed. The Supreme Court is anyway hearing uh, a petition on this, on this point. Uh, this would open up the scope for, of privately run portals that provide lawyer client matching and other services. This would in turn improve the price and quality signals that are available to litigants. Uh, information on advocate fees is a huge gap that we see, but what really is uh, something that's uh, that needs a lot more discussion is a broad reform of the legal profession, which is really something that I think a lot of papers could be written on. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think this is a great paper. Uh, it will, uh, you know, it has a lot of information and it will certainly help improve the quality of the discourse on this subject. So the way I have structured my comments is more, you know, from the perspective of publishing, assuming that you guys intend to publish this paper. So uh, I have some structural comments. I mean, I'll just restrict myself. There are a lot of smaller, you know, issues that I'll anyway send you separately. Right now, I just wanted to talk mostly about the structural comments. So given that uh, this is an immensely vast topic, uh, I think it's 
probably useful to frame one or two clear and specific research questions that you can practically answer in one paper, right? And I'll give you the reason why I'm saying that, because your paper starts off with a you know very broad and ambitious goal to explain the challenges in accessing legal services in India and how to resolve this problem, right? Now, you move on to claiming that there are three factors that affect supply of legal services. One, professional quality control of lawyers. Two, lack of level playing field among lawyers. And third, uh, the BCI regulations restricting public engagement by lawyers, which basically includes the ban on advertising, right? Now, if I move directly into your conclusions, your conclusions are focused only on one remedy which pertains to the third factor, that is removing the ban or relaxing the ban on advertising by lawyers and regulating such advertising. Now, clearly you are not suggesting that this one reform is a panacea that will uh, you know, resolve the issues of professional quality and lack of level playing field. Uh, so therefore, it would be probably better if upfront you reframe the question uh, and make it more precise, something like you know whether relaxation in current blanket restrictions on advertising by lawyers could help improve access to legal services, right? I think that would actually make, I mean, give the clear impression as to what is exactly, uh, you know, the issue that you are tackling, because uh, there are other issues, say, for example, which you highlight, say, you know, the regulatory architecture, right, which you have highlighted, but you have not made any conclusions as such in the paper. So I think it's important to restrict yourself to a specific question, which to which you are answering uh, in the paper, and obviously that gets reflected in the conclusion part. Uh, also, uh, you know, you have cited a lot of relevant literature, which is quite useful. So I would suggest have a separate section on literature review and then explain what is the novel contribution that this paper is making, which you have mentioned somewhere, but there is no specific section dealing with uh, the existing literature review. And for structure generally, I would suggest you can look at Uma Khan's paper, the one that you have cited in footnote number 46. Uh, just see how structured that paper is. I think having that kind of a clear structure would help the reader uh, go through it and also help you with the publication process. Uh, separately on the BCI's regulatory architecture, I think, you know, uh, we, we tend to say that BCI has done a bad job, et cetera, et cetera. But if you actually see at the, uh, you know, at the Advocates Act of 1961, right, I think uh, they have done a tremendously good job uh, taking into account what is the stated intent of the law. Because Section 7.1b of the Advocates Act clearly says that the objective of BCI is to safeguard the rights, privileges, and interests of advocates, not consumers of legal services. So they have done a brilliant job by making the system opaque because that helps the cause of the advocates, right? So I think there's a structural problem with the regulatory architecture of BCI, and that's why you see BCI acting the way it does, right? And there are uh, some studies, I mean, I have also written something, if you look at other jurisdictions, they've completely moved on. I think Advocates Act 1961 is based on, uh, you know, a guild form of uh, thinking of a regulator, the way, say, stockbrokers had initially started the uh, stock exchange and then demutualization happened, etc. So I think Advocates Act is pre that thinking of regulatory reforms. And so there's a huge uh, scope of contributing to how the BCI's regulatory architecture needs to be upgraded in itself, right? Uh, the last point that I wanted to make was with respect to prestige, right? Uh, uh, so I think you referred to the Supreme Court judgment of 1962. I, 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 you know, 1962 was a very different uh, time. The judges who were there, I mean, they would have started practicing 30 years before 1962. And in all probably they were from the original side of the, you know, metropolitan cities, right? And original side advocates grew up at that time with the notion of barristers versus solicitor system. And that's the perspective from which they are essentially saying that arguing counsels who are essentially barristers should not be dealing with the client directly. And, and that was the established practice at that time, right? The practice has changed over time. Now, coming to today, the question is how does a lawyer signal quality? It is essentially fees, right? And uh, this leads to a set of problems in, uh, you know, which are ethical issues in the profession. And Pratap Bhanumet had a great article in 2010 or 2011 NUGS Law Review, where his main argument was that how do you create pecuni non pecuniary incentives in the legal profession? That, you know, can you create some kind of prestigious awards, etc., that people uh, say, you know, some kind of under 40. Uh, superstars of the legal profession for having won some great constitutional law cases, right? Can we create this kind of non pecuniary incentives to better align or make the, you know, uh, the right values in the legal profession matter and not just, uh, you know, live with the idea that the higher the fees, the better must be the quality of the lawyer. 
so with that i will uh, you know i'm happy to talk offline because i understand that there's some session after this so uh, if there are any specific questions or any any counter arguments i'm happy to uh, listen to them thank you